Morning, Glory America. Bonjour, hi, Canada. Hugh Hewitt live from Studio North on Friday, August the 5th in the year of our Lord, 2022. I am so glad you were with me. The biggest news of the day is that uh, Senator Sinema of Arizona has caved, and the Democrats in the Senate will pass. their are 725 pages of $433 billion in new spending and $739 billion in new taxes. It's astonishing. What did Senator Sinema get for it? She got a protection measure for billionaires, uh, a $14 billion tax increase on some wealthy hedge fund managers and private equity executives. That's what her price was. I'm actually jaw-droppingly, gap-mouth-opened, astonished at this bill. Again, 725 pages long. It spends another $433 billion, which will be amazingly inflationary on this economy, already struggling to keep inflation below 10%. It's at 9.1% right now. Uh, it's going to raise taxes and hire thousands of IRS agents, $739 billion in new taxes, tens of thousands of new IRS agents. And it's going to do all that when even any Democrat, one Democrat could have stopped it because they need all 50 Democrats and the vice president to vote for it. And they've, they've got them all signed up. There are six Democrats who are running for re-election. Six Democrats who are in danger this fall. And I think you know by now their names. You should, if you listen to my show, you should know who they, those, those Democrats are. Um, Maggie, uh, Michael Bennett in Colorado. Maggie Hassan in New Hampshire. Mark Kelly in Arizona. Um, Patty Murray in, in Washington State. Ocasio-Cortez in Nevada. And Raphael Warnick in Georgia. Bennett, Hassan, Kelly, Murray, Ocasio-Cortez, and Warnick. Each one of them could have gotten whatever they wanted for Colorado, for New Hampshire, for Arizona, for Washington State, for Nevada, for Georgia. Whatever they wanted. Because it's a 50-vote deal. They've got complete leverage. None of them asked for anything. None of them got uh, border protection. None of them got... And that's especially important for, of course, um, Arizona, Kelly, and Nevada, Ocasio-Cortez. But it actually affects every single senator. None of them got a new power facility. None of them got a military base protected or expanded. None of them got a weapon system that is particularly unique to their state. Like Kelly could have gotten the A-10s in Arizona secured. None of them got anything for NASA or the NIA or any of their states. Nothing. Zero. Because they're morons. They just went along with Chuck Schumer to raise taxes before an election. And not just taxes. I mean, everybody's taxes. And Joe Biden immediately came out and did a Zoom call yesterday. And, I, I, I mean, he's, he's incoherent. And he's not telling the truth. Cut number one. I, I did. I must admit, in total disclosure, I've, I've spoken to the chairwoman about the possibility of my being able to buy one of those Corvettes that are electric vehicles. That, uh, you know, when they come out, uh, I'm not going to be able to do it because I can't drive a vehicle while I'm vice president, while I'm president anymore than I can when I was vice president. But yeah, that's not funny and it's not true. Uh, Joe Biden went on in that White House Zoom. I mean, he, like, I hope the guy recovers quickly. He looks awful. He's in week two of COVID. Cut number two. Let me be clear. Despite what some folks are saying. The Inflation Reduction Act makes sure that no one earning less than $400,000 a year will pay a penny more in federal taxes, notwithstanding all these ads you see on television. But don't take my word for it. Nearly 130 economists, seven Nobel laureates in economics, former, tr former Treasury secretaries, the Federal Reserve vice chair, former director of the Congressional Budget Office, wrote that this bill will, quote, fight inflation and lower costs for American families while setting the stage for a strong, stable, and broadly shared long-term economic growth, end of quote. This is absurd. And by the way, remember all those same economists said we wouldn't have anything, we wouldn't have inflation, that it would be transitory, that it wouldn't be so long, and it would depend upon supply chain. Everybody's been wrong about everything on his team. Now, Senator Coons is a good guy. He was at least honest about what's in the bill, or partly in the bill. Cut number three yesterday from a, uh, a rally that he was at. $60 billion dollars for environmental justice, for neighborhoods and communities that have asked for decades 
when will there be relief from the part of the 60 air, billion for environmental justice ground. what does that mean that actually means consultants and the elite class who write reports and don't dig anything in the ground you're not going to see a dime of that environmental justice i've been dealing with those it's re it's rhetoric designed to advance no growth agenda in states that desperately need growth and housing Randy Weingarten, the voice of the uh, school teachers unions across the United States at the same press conference said this, cut number four. Where's the education pieces here? Where's the education pieces here? Climate change. If we actually stop these extreme weather events. Okay, so uh, Randy Weingarten is out there saying the bill will stop extreme weather events. It's all hoo-ha. And I just go back to the practical politics of this. There are six senators who could have had whatever they wanted. Literally, you know, you name that A-10 base in Arizona that, that John McCain and Martha McSally fought to save forever. Mark Kelly gave it up. Michael Bennett in Colorado, you name me anything you wanted. Any bridge, any road, any tunnel, any uh, conservation program, any drought relief, any firefighting effort, you could have had it. Maggie Hassan in New Hampshire, you could have had new schools and every, you know, New Hampshire's not that big. I drive through it on the way to Maine. It's just not that big. You'd have whatever you want. Patty Murray in Washington State, you could have gotten the submarines you need to be serviced up there. You could have expanded the submarine pens up there. Ocasio-Cortez in Nevada, border relief, immigration relief, whatever you want. It got nothing. Raphael Warnick in Georgia, you could have taken care of that airport nightmare. Uh, all of you, all of you just said, nah, go ahead. We'll just raise taxes. The bill is 725 pages long. It is unbelievable. All right, other news yesterday. Alex Jones got hit with a $4.1 million judgment to Sandy Hook. He runs InfoWars. He's been battling these parents who he slandered for a long time, saying that the Sandy Hook massacre, that horrible, horrible thing, was a giant hoax. The first of many lawsuits hit him with a $4.1 million judgment. And there are more coming. His lawyers probably committed malpractice. I don't know. I'm not a judge and jury on that. But uh, the, they, they, they really conducted a crazy trial. Meanwhile, Ron DeSantis suspended a Tampa prosecutor yesterday. And this is an important story for everyone. Governor Common Sense DeSantis had a prosecutor in, uh, I think it's Broward County, in Tampa, who said, I'm not going to enforce the laws of this state against abortion providers, late-term abortion. I'm not going to enforce the laws of this state against people teaching human intimacy and sexuality to kindergartners. I'm going to do it. I'm just not going to enforce it. Andrew Warren is his name, and DeSantis suspended him yesterday en route to firing him. Here he is at the press conference, cut number nine. Uh, yeah, we'll start cut number 19. We won't be able to play it all. By definition, not be prosecuted. That has undermined public safety. It has really hurt these communities, uh, and it's been devastating to the rule of law. So as I saw that happening across the country earlier this year, I asked my staff in my office to look around the state of Florida and to make sure that that was not going to happen here, where you would have individual prosecutors nullify laws that were enacted by the people's representatives. They spoke with law enforcement throughout the state. They spoke with line prosecutors throughout the state. Uh, and it all came back to this area here in the 13th Judicial Circuit in Hillsborough County. And the uh, response that we got was a lot of frustration on the part of law enforcement for criminals being let go and crimes not being prosecuted. Uh, and so we looked into it and we, we compiled a, a lot of the record and I can tell you it's been a very, very troubling record. So uh, the prosecutor, state attorney for this judicial circuit, uh, Andrew Warren, has put himself publicly above the law. In June of 2021, he signed a letter saying that he would not enforce any prohibitions on sex change operations for minors. And that's a debate that we're having mostly administratively and through medical licensing in Florida, but other states have enacted penalties on the people that would perform those, which are really disfiguring these young kids. And he said, it doesn't matter what the legislature does in the state of Florida, uh, he's gonna exercise a veto over that. He's also instituted policies of, quote, presumptive non-enforcement. And this involves an array of different things, and you'll probably hear Sheriff Cronister and some of the other law enforcement officers talk about it. Uh, but that is not consistent with the role 
of a prosecutor. Yes, you can. No, it's not. And, and, and DeSantis is 100 percent on target to suspend Warren. He should fire him if he can. I don't care if he's elected. If you're elected to do a law enforcement job and you're not enforcing the law, you ought to get the, the boot. So bravo, Governor DeSantis. Lots more coming up. But I just want to remind you, those six senators, Maggie Hassan and Raphael Warnick and Mark Kelly and the rest, they all screwed their states. Remember that, America. I mean, Sonny Bunch is in the house. Of course, Sonny, official film critic of The Hugh Hewitt Show, also at The Bulwark. Also, across the movie aisle podcast is his as his Bulwark goes to the movies. And Sonny, good Friday to you on this August 5th. How are you? I'm good, Hugh. How are you doing? Good. I want to ask you a specific question before going to a general thing. Uh, sure. This is I went and saw, because I've got every grandchild in the lower 48 with me, and they've got, there are five of them. I took the oldest two, the 10-year-old, the scholar, and the 8-year-old, the artful dodger, to see the League of Super Pets. And, you know, as children's movies go, it's pretty good for an adult. There's some pretty funny Batman stuff in it that made me laugh, and the kids were asking me, I was laughing, but... I, but there's also a same-sex couple in there, which is, you know, fine by me and uh, not an issue for me. But it is going to be an issue for some people. And I wonder why. Why does Disney purposefully step on a rail that could lose them some viewers? Uh, well, that's Warner Brothers. I, it's funny. I saw League of Super Pets as well, and I don't even remember the same. It, oh, it's a very thing brief thing in the park when the pets are playing. Uh, I, yeah, I, I, I don't, rem- I mean, I just don't even remember that. It, it's so brief that it, 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 see, I, I, why did they do it? I mean, I, I don't know. It, it didn't, it didn't jump out at me. Uh, so you barely it, see I, it. I, and I said to my, I just made a note to ask Sonny about this because it's not germane to the plot. It's at the, where the three dogs are talking, the super dog and the two normal dogs at the beginning and their owners are there and Superman is making out with Lois Lane. And the same-sex couple's in the background. And it's just like five seconds. And I just said, why? Why? Yeah, I mean, I, again, I, I didn't even see it. So I, I feel like it, it's one of these things you have to be kind of super, super attuned to, to see. Uh, Hugh, I mean, I, it, it did, did not jump out at me when I saw it with, with my kids. I, mean, my well, kids I, I am not super attuned to that, but it. I saw it. And I just said to myself, I wonder if Disney has a quota now in every kid's movie where they've got to make kids feel good who have same-sex parents because maybe that's it yeah i mean again not not disney this is a warner brothers movie so you okay know, it's not it's, disney it's warner okay it's, it's just by the all, way what uh, did you think of it did you agree with my assessment it's pretty good i mean i didn't i didn't really enjoy it honestly it was it was it's the weird thing about this movie is that it the the voice casting in it is very off uh somehow so you know it stars Dwayne Johnson, uh, The Rock, as Crypto, the super dog, who's Superman's dog. Uh, and then it, it also has uh, Kevin Hart as a stray slash pound dog who, uh, you know, spoiler, it's in the trailer, so I don't think it's too much of a spoiler. It goes on to become Batman's dog. And uh, the, the problem with casting Kevin Hart in a movie like this, Kevin Hart has one very recognizable mode, which is kind of exasperated manic. Uh, you know, very kind of like frustrated, fast-talking manic mode. And in this movie, he's all, it's like he's on Xanax the whole time. He's very subdued huh? um, and very, you know, very, very sleepy, sleepy-eyed, sleepy voice. And I just, I didn't understand what, what the point of hiring him for this role is if you're going to have him be so laid back. You know, there are some funny jokes in the background. The Batman There's stuff funny is funny. Stuff. The There's, Batman stuff is like Batman the Batman stuff. Lego stuff. It's just a, sure, it, some, it's mocking themselves. Sure, there's some, there's some funny Batman stuff. There's some funny you know licensing stuff. There you know if yes, you watch the yes. background, the background news crawls. There are jokes for for adults. Uh, but and the, the Thor thing, hammer. I, I, if I had a hammer, they're making fun of Marvel at little points in this. Yeah, yeah. There 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 are a few good jokes. I mean, I, I it was okay. I guess it was definitely more watchable for an adult than say Minions. Rise of Gru, uh, you know you're you're gonna you're better off there for sure. I think next week um, I've got to go see the Paws of Fury movie. Yeah, that one is bad. That, that one is, looks well, really that bad. bad. It's also it's, it's also interesting though. It's it's kind of a it's it's almost a shot for shot remake of Blazing Saddles. Weirdly, what? Um, it, it, but for for kids, but you you can't actually acknowledge any of the stuff that makes Blazing Saddles funny or you know transgressive you can't really do the racial humor or any of that wow. so 
it's very um, neutered. A you very know what's above version. the child's level that adults get is the training montage joke, which I think is also in Pause of Fury from the trailer. Because oh, yeah, we need a training and, montage. That's a wink, right? Well, yeah, and, and everybody does that now. It's almost hack, like it's yes. almost hack and cliche. I mean, everybody makes that joke now. Oh, we need a montage, and you know where that comes from is uh, that's that is a a. South Park bit. South Park did that, you know, twenty years ago. They they had a. Very I didn't funny, know that. Oh yeah, uh, they, there was a, there was an episode at, uh, getting it, digging into the weeds here, but there was an episode of South Park where uh, um, they go to a uh, ski resort and the kids learn how to uh, learn how to ski, and there's there's just this whole song that's like we we're gonna need a montage montage. <laughs> And it's, it's like it's like something out of Rocky, you know. But, but what's the first really training scary. montage? Is it Rocky or is it Karate Kid? I mean, I don't know what the first training montage is, but there are like a million of them. Oh, I mean, I, I specifically what that was making fun of was Rocky, uh, but I think you could probably even go further back to you know the the the, the sports movies of the nineteen forties and nineteen fifties. You know, the boxing movies in the nineteen forties and nineteen fifties. There's always. Uh, a training sequence where yes. you know a guy gets good. They're running on logging roads like in the it's cold. Fun. They're running up the steps of the Philadelphia Art Museum. All right, so I've taken enough of your of your critic time. What do you want to critic uh, criticize and 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 recommend for the weekend? All right. So first big big movie out this weekend is Bullet Train, which stars Brad Pitt. Oh Pins, yes. Uh, and a whole host of characters. It's a ensemble action thriller comedy type movie, right? Um, and it's it, I, I, when I say it's an ensemble, uh, you know, Brad Pitt is technically the lead. He's the guy on all the posters and everything. Really, the stars of this movie, the two protagonists anyway, are uh, Aaron Taylor, Aaron Taylor Johnson, and Brian Tyree Henry, uh, who play a couple of uh, hitmen slash uh, assassins slash bodyguards. Codename Tangerine and Lemon. Uh, there's a, but there, there, there are like eight different guys in this movie. I'm not going to run through all of them because that would be boring. Um, suffice to say that this movie reminds me uh, a little bit of Snatch, the Guy Ritchie movie, um, by way of uh, John Wick. It's from one of the directors of John Wick. It's from, more importantly, it's from the studio. Uh, that put together the fight sequences in John Wick, right? It's from Ah, the very small spaces. Yeah. Right. So, uh, and on top of that, it has a very convoluted plot structure that calls to mind um, something like the the movie Smoke and Aces, which is a cult hit. Smoke and Aces is also a key reference point here because that's a movie with a bunch of different, you know, colorfully uh, designed assassins, and they're all doing battle with each other. They've all been brought together, and they've all got to, you know, kind of take each other out. Um, so that is what's going on in this movie. It is uh, it is a movie that is kind of full of big stars and also smaller stars, smaller character actors who are playing colorfully designed assassins who have a very convoluted and complicated reason for being on this train. And the fight sequences are all designed with the train in mind. They're all brought to life by the John Wick team. So all of that sounds awesome, right? Like all of this is like, oh, this sounds like a really good movie. And all of those component parts are pretty good, and yet the whole thing just doesn't work. It doesn't work. It's too long. It's it's stretched out. It's it's overly padded for for something that um, again from from the guys who made John Wick, uh, or at least from one of the directors of John Wick, from the action team of John Wick. You know, that's a movie where if you go back and watch it, there's about twenty five to thirty minutes of setup and anticipation in that film. You know, very uh, it's very kind of, um, I don't know, it's very, it's, you're building a lot of ground there, and then, boom, you're off like a bullet out of a gun for the next hour, just action sequence after action sequence. And instead, in this movie, you, you, you have all of these flashbacks. So the movie starts, and there's an action sequence, and there's a flashback explaining how that character got there, and then you're, you get some exposition for like 10 minutes. And then there's an action sequence, and then there's a flashback, and then maybe there's some action in the flashback. But but it it's like going, it's like being in a in, let's let's use the metaphor of the movie. You're in a bullet train, you're going forward 200 miles an hour, and all of a sudden the conductor just slams on the brakes and throws you in reverse for 20 miles an hour for a couple minutes, and then you go shooting forward again, uh, and then you stop and you sit there at the station for 10 minutes, 
and then you go shooting forward again. I mean, it's really herky jerky. It just has no pace. Um, it's all off. And I, you know, in a movie like this, pacing matters a lot. You know, for for a big action popular type movie this is not an art house film right this is not something that you are going yeah, it's supposed to be a blockbuster and in fact i was going to go see it i think i'm getting a tentative don't see it from sunny bunch it, I, I, it's it's one of these movies where i feel like it will grow on me as the years go on but after one viewing i gotta tell you i just came out of it thinking that didn't work that did not that did not work I, for me so i have a big of, question for a little bit of time Brad sure. Pitt in the trailer seemed to me to be playing Brad Pitt and always plays Brad Pitt. Whereas, you know, for example, Tom Hanks is always somebody different, most recently Elvis. Mm -hmm. Is Brad Pitt just become Brad Pitt? I mean, it's the same character as Ocean's 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, the same credit burn after reading. Yeah, it's just the same character. Well, I don't think that's fair at all. I don't think that's a fair way to describe uh, his character in Bird after reading in Ocean's 11 through 13. In Ocean's 11 through 13, he's kind of a cool, silent guy. In you know uh, in in Bird After Reading, he's kind of a, a, a twitchy dork. Um, you know, he definitely has that. He definitely has a look and a vibe to him. Yes, um, but you know, uh, it, he's different. He's different in this than in say uh, Troy, right, where he plays Achilles. No, or, no, no. Uh, Brad Pitt or, is Brad Pitt is Brad Pitt. There's, a, I mean, he never goes into the fat suit. He doesn't do the Sea Shepherd. I mean. Yeah. The range go is back, limited, back, Sonny. Again, go back, go back to Snatch. I mentioned Snatch. Remember, he plays same the, character, uh, the, the the Pikey, the Pikey know, comic figure, the comic. You know, that's, that's very different. Charisma Central, the guy, the hero. He's the hero of every movie. Well, that that's mostly true, but he is he is a he is a big uh, big hero guy. So that has that's he ever played a like, villain? I, he's definitely he's definitely like the. Or Gen X slacker, right? He is like the the guy with yes. the, like kind of comfortable clothes and big long shaggy hair. Like, yes, that's, that's a fair way to fair way to put it. Um, but, but he's definitely that way. Look, I I, I can't give this movie a strong recommend. Uh, the, very very quickly because I know we're running out of time. Uh, the the new Ron Howard film Thirteen Lives uh, is out on Prime Video. This what's weekend, the name of it? Uh, Thirteen Lives. It's about the the rescue of the 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 kids from the the cave in Thailand. Oh, you know that story. The, yes, the soccer team. So this it's it's about two and a half hours long. It's a it's it's a movie about that rescue. It's directed by Ron Howard. Um, uh, it has a bunch of good stars: Diego Mortensen, Colin Farrell. They Colin didn't Farrell. open that in theaters. It was. It's a Prime Video movie. It's an Amazon movie. So it was. It played in theaters for about a week. Uh, and now it played in about, I don't know, played in like 200 theaters for about... 15 uh, seconds, Sonny. Off. Thumbs up or thumbs down on that? Because I thought I, w I would watch that on just what you said. It's, it's thumbs up. It's thumbs up. It's, it's a pretty straightforward procedural uh, thriller, not really action, but, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a procedural type movie. But it's, it's really we will go. It's Ron Howard. It's Ron Howard doing Apollo 11, but in a cave. In a cave. Ron... Sonny Bunch, at Sonny Bunch on Twitter, across the movie aisle, the bulwark goes to the movies. Thanks. Now by the Poet Laureate of the Hugh Hewitt Show, Tarzana Joe, for his regular Friday appearance. Good morning, Joe. Good morning, Hugh. I have a poem for you today. Oh. That's a change of pace. Uh, and it goes like this. Two words in our language pave the road to devastation. Those words, in fact, are omnibus and reconciliation. <laughs> For hidden in those syllables so dense and unforgiving are secret ways that they devise to change the way we're living. Yes, deep inside a measure to protect the noble beagle are paragraphs unnoticed making kitty cats illegal. <laughs> a bill to save the planet, which is something we should do, makes you get a permit for your Sunday barbecue. Oh, how the pundits wonder why they've lost our rapt attention when the world is filled with nonsense that the media don't mention. Votes are bought coercively with orchestrated shaming. The titles of these measures are examples of dead naming. The bill to save the budget is a farce and no one trusts it. It doesn't save the budget in reality, it busts it. The Anything Protection Act does just what you expected. It guarantees that everything is ruined and neglected. Huh. So when they pass a law to true the vote or clean the air, I offer this suggestion. Beware, my friends, beware. That's What's What by Teresa Joe. What's What? You know, Joe, I've got a new friend in Maine, Charlotte, who, uh, who loves your segment. 
Uh, she said, I just think Tarzona Joe is the greatest. And I said, he's been doing it for 22 years. And, you know, I had new listeners in Maine all over the place because of WGAN. And uh, you got, have you got written any Mainer poems yet? I just uh, wrote two poems for a gentleman in Kennebunkport. There you go. That, you know, down east is next, Joe. And uh, did you get Mainer inflection? Pat and I went up to Muskegon <laughs> Farm. Did you get that worked in? No, no, it was a straight poem. Because that's going to be hard for a Queens kid. Slovenia, so, so. Yeah, it's going to be very hard for a Queens kid to put on the Down East accent. <laughs> I'm not even going to try. Okay. Tarzana Joe at Reagan.com for all of your poetry needs. Tarzana Joe at Reagan.com or visit Tarzana Joe.com, which is reliably reported to be working again. Absolutely. All right. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Hugh.